My name is uh, Jakub Zalas. I'm a software consultant helping companies with their code, uh, improving the code, writing, uh, putting more quality into the code, uh, applying techniques like test-driven development, behavior-driven development, um, in general topics uh, related to quality. I'm also one of the Symfony core team members. That's why most of my projects are Symfony-based. Um, but I have also experience with some other frameworks. Um, I also run the Symfony meetups here in London. So if you're in London, our next meetup is going to be in April. Um, yeah, today I'll, I'm here to speak about um, migrations of spaghetti legacy projects to more modern technologies. So the plan, oh, that's not going to work. The plan for today is first clarify what we're going to talk about, what kind of projects we're going to talk about, uh, what is spaghetti or legacy or a big ball of mud uh, project. Um, then we'll discuss some migration strategies, how we can approach those projects and try to move away from the legacy. And um, finally, uh, the biggest part of the presentation is the migration, migration uh, cookbook, which is some ideas for, uh, to apply for you uh, in your projects and um, try to move away from legacy. So practical code examples, uh, some ideas to build on. So what is spaghetti code or legacy code? In the, for, for the purpose of this talk, I treat these terms as the same, more or less. Basically, what we're going to talk about is something that we want to move away from, something that we can't work uh, with anymore, something that's not manageable, that's hard to maintain. Basically, no one wants to work on it. Right, so, twisted and tangled like a bowl of spaghetti. Okay, another term of calling it is legacy code, which is, it relates to some kind of an unsupported technology, unsupported framework, um, or technology that's, that became obsolete, that's no longer uh, used by, by anyone. So, perhaps this we've got problems finding new developers because no one wants to work with the technology anymore. Um, interesting definition of legacy code was given uh, by um, Michael Feathers in his Working Effectively with Legacy Code uh, book. And that he says that legacy code is a code without tests. So if you're writing code that has no tests, you're already writing a legacy. Which kind of makes sense. Because um, the side effect of writing tests is better design. You put more effort into design. You are kind of forced to do that. Um, so by definition, if you uh, don't write tests, you don't pay that much attention to design, and you basically end up with a mess sooner or later. My favorite definition, a big ball of mud, is of hazardly structures, cloning, sloppy duct tape, and bailing wire spaghetti code jungle. So this kind of projects we'll talk about, um, how to move away. But don't be mistaken, there's also a good part of, of having a legacy project. First of all, it works. Okay? It serves its purpose. It's deployed to life. Users use it. Organization benefits from it. It brings money or helps to save money. Um, so it definitely has value. And um, another aspect of it is that some time ago, someone, perhaps you or maybe your predecessors, um, talked to the client, talked to the product owner, whoever had the, the business knowledge, and uh, extracted the requirements and put that into the code. He might have obfusc obfuscated it a bit. The code is no longer readable. But that doesn't change anything. The, the knowledge about the, the, the business domain is still there in your code. So it still has value. Um, you can still learn from it. So why we would want to migrate? Very often uh, people want to migrate just because there's a new shiny tool there and they just want to use it. CV driven development. They just want to put a new thing on the CV so they try to convince the business that they need to migrate. Okay? This is for me not a good justification of doing that. Good justification would be, okay, we can no longer work with that code base. It's really a mess. Um, adding features takes 
a long time, so perhaps we should consider uh, moving away from it and starting a new thing. Um, and you have to figure whether that's worth it or not long term uh, to start a new code base and uh, move, move away from the, from the old one. Uh, quite a valid point is uh, obsolete technology. Like uh, with the situation now with Symfony 1. Uh, Symfony 1 and Symfony 2 are totally different frameworks. And um, it's really hard to find the developers who would want to work with Symfony 1. There's still some alive. There, there's still some people who remember Symfony 1. But kind of no one wants to work with it. It's not good for the career. It's not good for the progression. Uh, so companies who have Symfony 1 projects struggle with finding developer of developers to hire. So that would be a valid point to try to migrate to a newer version of the framework. Another thing, perhaps scaling issues. If you can't solve it on the current code base, you probably want to migrate it. So what could we do? What are our options? We have two strategies available. Cold turkey and chicken little. And in this talk, I'll talk about only about one of them. But let's briefly look at uh, what these strategies are. So the first one, called Turkey, is it when you try to rewrite everything from scratch at once. So you look at the existing project and say, we're going to rewrite it in a new version of the framework, new technology, whatever. Um, you spend months of development, and then perhaps migrate the data and deploy a new version, switch off the old system, put the new version live. Most of the time, I know a few cases where this approach succeeded, but most of the time it fails. And most of the time it takes significantly more time to develop a new version than initially uh, predicted. The reason for that is most of the time the fact that when we look at the existing system, we underestimate it. And as we progress with the development, redevelopment, we find things inside that we, for, no one remembers about, we already forgot about them, or they basically not, in it, not needed anymore. Uh, so it's quite easy to understand and underestimate such projects. But it's also very similar to waterfall approach to, in new projects. It's basically a waterfall approach. Um, so it suffers from the same problems as waterfall. Basically, there's no learning process involved. We migrate the old system without reflecting each time whether this feature is still needed, whether it's usually one-to-one -one migration. So we, you know, feature that worked five years ago, you might need something else today. Business doesn't stand still. So one-to-one -one migration is almost never the, 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 the good thing to do. While well, the code Turkey approach encourages you that, to do that. Um, Another problem with this approach is that development of new features basically stops because you put the whole team on development of, of, of a new system. You might have a small team for, for, for adding new features, some are set aside, but then there's a constant catching up between the teams. Um, and still, you, you put less effort into developing new features than you probably would want to. Um, and finally, there's a very, very important uh, aspect of it, which is morale of a team that basically declines over the, the life of the project, as with Waterfall. Because you work on something, it takes, you, you can see that month after the month, you need, you see you, can, you need more time to do it, to, accomplish, to finish the project. It's never finished. Uh, your mor morale declines. You never deploy. Users don't use it. You work on something that's basically not used by anyone. While with the second approach, the chicken little, you take small steps. You look at your system, uh, try to assess what's the most critical part. That's one way of looking at it. Um, or what's the most uh, moving part. What part of the system changes a lot, so you work in there a lot. That's worth uh, migrating as well. And you work in smart iterations. You choose. Uh, part to migrate, spend sprint or few sprints uh, working on it, and then reflect. Okay, how did it go? Nice thing about it is, if you fail, that's only one sprint, or maybe a few sprints that you failed, but you can still look at what you've done, 
uh, React, change course, adapt course, and uh, um, start start again. That's only one sprint of effort that you wasted, not a few months of development. It's also easier to say, that was a mistake, we shouldn't have done this, let's just move another part. While on the long-term project, as you progress into months of development, it's harder to say no. You just spend so many months of development, you want to finish it. While you might realize it wasn't a good decision to do it. Um, you also might discover things that are no longer needed. So you look at your system, uh, your new product owner describes you the feature, you look at the legacy code and notice, but all these edge cases here, what are, the, what are they about? And he might say, well, we have used them five years ago, but today, that's obsolete, we, we don't need it. So you actually avoid writing code this way. You remove features, you remove edge cases, uh, come up with simpler solutions. Also, the experience you gained through uh, past years of a system working production might give you new insights, might, might, might um, change the way you look at the problem and the solution might, might be different. And this process is never finished. Um, and it's a good thing. Because you might realize that some things hardly ever change or are not really that painful. And you might decide that's not gonna, that never is going to be migrated. I'm, I'm not going to touch it. Like you might have uh, some kind of uh, internal ticketing system which was part of the application that just works. People just write in the descriptions that goes uh, to someone's email and that's good enough. Why bothering mig to migrate it? Okay. We never, we never, we never um, alter that code. And uh, you might actually uh, realize that uh, effort might be better used somewhere else. And then instead you focus on the most critical parts of the system. It gives you more uh, satisfaction because you deploy every sprint or every few sprints and you have just a feeling of you feel accomplished because users use this, the, the, the thing. It's more often integrated, so each deployment you integrate it with um, the legacy system and have you're certain that everything works because uh, you tested it before the deployment and it went live. It is used by the users. So it's a more agile approach. And that's what I found in my experience works. While the trying to ever, ever write everything at once usually doesn't work. Although, to be fair with you, I know a few cases where people managed to do that, but it was quite painful and always took more time than they thought it would take. So the cookbook. These are some ideas based on um, uh, my real life experience on working on legacy projects and migrating them to Symfony. But these are ideas to build on. The problem with legacy projects is that there's no two similar projects. Every project is different and it's hard to come up with something that's going to work for everyone. But I'm trying to give you some ideas that you can build on and uh, apply it to your projects. And uh, before we start, there's an important thing to mention. Uh, this would be a talk on its own. Uh, but writing tests for a new feature or a bug or uh, anything you do in the system is really your best way to get out of legacy. Writing tests forces you to do good design, to learn how to do good, good design. Um, and that's your best bet. So I've got uh, three groups of uh, ideas. And the first group is uh, taking really small steps and using uh, small components, either from Symfony or other uh, libraries, to apply in your legacy code. It's not always the best option, because usual advice is never try to modify the legacy code, because you'll definitely break it. But sometimes there's no other way. So you can take small steps and uh, try to uh, incorporate those, those little libraries in your uh, old framework. Uh, one of them is not really a part of Symfony, but it's part of kind of Symfony ecosystem, which is Twig. 
And um, if you have a system that uses old PHP templates, because someone thought that PHP is a templating language, um, Twig might help you to actually try to clean things up. Because Twig templates make it hard to put logic in. One of the problems with all system is that the logic is mixed with uh, the presentation layer, there's SQL query, queries in HTML, and then, you know, things like that. Uh, so trying to clean those layers up, introducing Tweak, might help you as a first step uh, to get out from legacy. And Tweak is very easy to set up. These two lines of code, you just need a, some kind of a loader uh, for templates. In this case, file system loader, it's going to load templates, find templates on the file system. And you create a Twig environment with some configuration, uh, like the cache directory, whether it's a development version, debug version, or not. And you're done. You can start rendering your templates. So you could start extracting your old templates into, the, into Twig, uh, move, uh, separate the, the, the presentation logic from your business logic, um, write some Twig extensions as a first step uh, towards the migration. Another common thing to do is to leverage the service container. Um, as you start writing new things, you cover them by tests, uh, you learn about dependency injection, uh, managing that uh, object starts to be quite a pain, and the service container might help you to manage them. Basically, configure the way objects are created, and the definitions are separate from the way the objects are used. This is an uh, example from the Symfony container. Um, we use the container builder to define our services. Um, one of the options is to set parameters that can be later referenced. And we register our uh, first service, which is uh, named DB. It's a PDO uh, object uh, with some arguments. This way, if you, if you use PDO directory or another persistent layer there, um, you might start extracting your uh, queries into repositories. So move them away from your old legacy code base to some more structured tested uh, code base, new fresh code base. Um, register your repository that depends on the database. Um, you could do the same. You know, Symfony has a few ways of config configuring the same thing, uh, which is good because you can choose the one that suits you the best. If you want to store configurations in uh, YML files or XML files, this is how it would look like. Um, you create, again, the container builder, but then you use the YAML file loader in this case to load services uh, YML file, and then define the same thing we saw on the previous slide in a YML file. And then, I'll just skip this. You use it like this. Okay, so instead of those uh, hundreds or tens of lines of code, you just reference the repository um, and use it here. Ask the container, please give me the repository. Nice thing about it is you don't really know how it's created, and you don't care. As long as it conforms to the interface, you just use it. In real life project, you would actually want to also cache that container because what we used is a container builder that's pretty inefficient on a real life project. So usually, that, this is what Symfony does behind the scenes. If you use the container yourself, you would need to um, cache it in some kind of file, dump it to the file. This is what this code does. Okay? If the container file cache file doesn't exist, um, well, if it does exist, we require it and create it right away. So all the services there will be defined. Otherwise, we build the, the container um, at the services and uh, dump it to a file. You can find it in documentation. So dependency injection is a way of applying inversion controls. So inversion of controls, so decoupling your layers of the application. And then another way of doing the thing is with event dispatcher and events. 
So you could uh, also start using an event dispatcher in an old legacy project to also extract parts of your of code out of the, the, the legacy and nicely test it. This is um, an example of how uh, event dispatcher works. So imagine we have a registration process. This is your registration class that registers a user on your site. We also have an event dispatcher. That's, that's the thing coming from Symfony. And then we write event listeners. So you could imagine the registration process would be the basic stuff that needs to happen during registration, probably saving user to the database. Um, and then any additional features, additional functionalities that happen during the same time are implemented to listeners. So the way it happens is we tell the, the event dispatcher, hey, each time you have a successful registration, let me know. And then when the, even the registration uh, process starts, um, the registration has uh, a reference to event dispatcher and tells him, hey, if anyone is interested, I just successfully registered the user. And then it knows that the mailer listener wanted to know about it, notifies it. Notice one thing. That's why it's also a way of uh, um, accomplishing dependency inversion. If you suddenly have a new requirement to also send a text message during the registration process, you do not modify the registration at all. You just register a new listener on the dispatcher, and then when the registration process starts, the dispatcher will notify both listeners. So you can actually add functionality without modifying the existing code and test it in, the, in isolation. Example of how to use the dispatcher, well, you instantiate it, and then this is how you register listeners. A listener could be an callable, an PHP callable. So it might be an anonymous function, or it might be a callback like this. And then if you connect even dispatcher with the service container, it might be a service name and a service method which is actually, for performance, this is what you would want to do. Because in this way, you would need to instantiate all the listeners every time, while not all of the events will happen during that execution time. With the service container, in combination of um, using the event dispatcher with the service container, only the objects that listen to a given event will be created when that event happens. And this is how you would dispatch the event. You can uh, use one of the built-in events or create your own ones. An event is just something that carries data, context of that event happening. So in this case, we have user registered event, and we pass the user in, and dispatch the registration success. At that time, all the listeners that were interested in the event will be called. Simple thing to do, but very powerful. Uh, I'll also show you how to share such events uh, between the applications later. Finally, um, what you could also do is start using message queues to offload the legacy application and start extracting your code into the new one. Um, one of the examples, real life use cases I've, I've had was I was working on the weather portal. Uh, which uh, displayed weather information for, for resorts, holiday resorts, basically. And um, those, that weather information was fetched from multiple feeds of data from, from different kinds of uh, data providers. So most popular resorts were fetched every uh, hour or every uh, 15 minutes, I don't remember exactly, uh, via Chrome job, but it was simply not possible to import all the resorts in the background. So the less popular resorts, if you were unlucky and uh, hit the website for such a resort, um, the website would make all those uh, calls to the external APIs. User would wait for a minute, and he would see the weather. Okay. Um, it was very easy to do. Just instead of fetching all those uh, feeds live, send a small message to the queue, and you have a new code base separate application that takes care of handling those messages. 
user would get the information while fetching your data, and a refresh after a few seconds that was usually enough to, for data to be processed in background. Um, and we had our process extracted on the new code base, tested uh, something we could work with and we're happy with. Sending a message to the queue might be as simple as sending a car comment. It's just some kind of a payload we sent to a uh, message queue. Doesn't matter how it is. You have lots of libraries, very nice libraries from uh, PHP. I'm a cook, uh, Very nicely integrates with Symfony. Second uh, group of solutions is more clear, uh, introduces more clear separation. Okay? In the previous solutions, we needed to integrate, uh, integrate into the legacy code. In this case, we introduced more uh, separation between the two. So one thing we could do is to wrap the legacy up into um, our new shiny code base. And example based on Symfony. Let's say we want to rewrite the whole products page. Just that one page, one single page out of the whole application. Okay? Every request now will go through Symfony. Um, and router will see. Uh, okay, I have products, and I have products controller here. That's in Symfony. Okay, let's render the response. Return it to the user. But then we'll have a catch all route that's going to catch every other request and forward it to the old application. So everything else will go through some kind of a legacy controller that's going to call our legacy app. So this way we can gradually move things to the new app while the old one is uh, phased out. Example of you, how you could configure it. This is a routing file from a uh, standard Symfony project. Um, by default, you only have a one root defined there, the app that imports all the root definitions from the app bundle. And then we added the fallback root, um, which basically catches all the paths. So this is important that this root is defined as the last one, because if anything else fails to match, this will always match. So there's no, never going to be a 404 in Symfony. Um, we define everything for path, change the requirements for paths, so by, by default it won't match the slash for a slash, we want to match it, everything can be in the path. And this route will call our legacy controller. And how this controller looks like, that depends on your application. This is a very simple option. Uh, we start output buffering, so everything that happens from now on will be stored in the buffer. It won't be displayed to the browser right away. And we call the legacy application in some way. In this case, we have a single point of entry on the single front controller index.php, and we simply require it. All the context from the outside is available inside. So you could actually preset some variables here as well. Um, finally, whatever was generated during that required phase, we get it into the content and then return the response. Nice thing about it is that you can call some things before this happens and after this happens. Um, so you can already start doing, processing some general uh, things like, I don't know, GOIP lookups in Symfony, move that into the new code base. Um, there's a huge drawback that is hardly so simple. Most of the time, legacy applications have multiple controllers. You need to handle it here some way. And there's more things to uh, look at. They might be setting some weird cookies. Um, session is a huge problem. Uh, but uh, Symfony has some built-in mechanism to work with the legacy session. So you need to configure the PHP bridge. If the legacy application starts the session and you can't change it, uh, you can use the PHP bridge session. Um, so the Symfony will deal with that. Um, if, um, depending on whether the uh, handler, session handler is set within the legacy app or not, you can also set the handler ID here or set it to null. Um, one thing to be careful here, your old legacy app probably accesses the session variable directly and puts everything into the global session variable. And in Symfony we have 
parameter box and everything is put into smaller containers. So you can't really access anything directly on the session, but there's a way around it. Uh, you can see an example on this, this uh, Theodo bundle. Uh, um, you'll need to modify it a bit uh, for your purposes, but it gives you a good idea how this should be handled so you can actually access the session directly uh, and the scalar value stored uh, in, the, in the session directly. We can also invert the situation a little bit because in the, the first one we were calling the legacy app from the um, new, new application. Uh, legacy app was a fallback. We could also do that on the infrastructure level. So have some kind of um, proxy load balancer uh, that would point to the legacy application by default, and then pages we migrate will be rewritten to a new one. Nicely separation, code bases are totally separate. Um, we don't deal with legacy at all. Uh, I have an example how to do it based on Nginx, but you can do it in different uh, proxies as well. Even if you use Apache, you could put Nginx in front of your Apache uh, and then forward to your right virtual host. This is a standard, more or less standard configuration of a vhost in the Nginx for my app. And the root folder, as you see, is my app legacy. Um, so this is how it would be before we came and tried to rewrite it. And then let's say we want to rewrite the products page, actually a specific product, product slash something. Okay, we can proxy pass it to version two of our application. So in this, at this point, everything will be handled by legacy, but only this single route that matches this is gonna be forwarded to the new one. And then as you progress, you can add more rewrites here uh, until eventually you hopefully remove the legacy app at all. Notice that it uh, rewrites uh, the host. This is the host, uh, host it rewrites to. So it has a different uh, document route, uh, my new app uh, web folder. And um, we need to bring back the old host because we just changed the host to v2 my app dev and uh, I want to s my all, both applications to see the same host to be on the same uh, server. How you could create such uh, new apps? I really like going micro. I don't want to mention microservices here, but some kind of a smaller applications. Um, Symfony 2.8 introduced uh, the microkernel, which is really nice uh, way of learning Symfony and a really nice way of starting very small. So you just require the Symfony package and create your kernel. This, this way you could have your whole Symfony application in a single file. Uh, you include the microkernel trait, which enables this functionality. It's a kernel like another, as an, in, in the full stack Symfony framework. You just annotate it with the, uh, the kernel trait. You can enable any bundles you need. Um, and then you have an option to configure the container. So instead of doing that in a YML file or another external thing, you do it here. Although you could include the uh, external files as well if you wanted to. But the idea of the micro uh, framework is that it's uh, very simple. And you also have an option apart from the container configuration, so where you can configure uh, your bundles or add services, define services. You can also configure your roots and you have an option to point your roots to the current kernel. So with the notation kernel column and the action name, you can actually point to the, this, this action is defined in the same file. This is a really easy way to start with Symfony. You just create a single file um, and easily can create a small service that's gonna be on the new code base with better practices, better tested. Um, what's an advantage of using this uh, over Silex or any other micro framework is 
that this is really a Symfony project. And uh, yeah, so you, you define it as an, an Avers, uh, you bootstrap it as an Avers Symfony project. This could be all in one file, but doesn't have to. Um, it's not that important, but what's important that you can actually revert back to the full stack framework. You just remove the trait, uh, load your external configuration, um, and you can scale this way. So you can start simple, small, but then scale to the bigger application. And just take the config from Symfony Standard Edition, uh, put that stuff that's relevant for you uh, in, and uh, you're done. What I want to uh, indicate here is that it's very good to try to design smaller apps. Um, right, you might be rewriting your old app page by page and put it into the same application, but think about it for a while and consider if you could actually design several smaller applications. So maybe your checkout process is a separate application to the uh, product catalog. Okay. Both use the product somehow, but if you think about it, it's not the same product. It's a different context. In the product catalog, you, you need different methods, different behavior than in your checkout process. Or maybe this is not what it looks like. Maybe this is a product and this is just a basket item or a, an order item. It's not the same thing. By introducing smaller apps, you introduce a clear separation. You already failed designing a big monolith Everything, you created a spaghetti there. Um, try designing smaller apps. It's, and don't try to share things uh, just because you think they're similar. Actually try to duplicate things. Uh, and only share them when it makes sense, when you have two, three use cases for that. The, the clear separation between projects makes it harder to mess up, in my opinion. It's much harder to mix the layers. And finally, we might take a bit of a hybrid approach. It's not always possible to clearly separate the two applications. It's not always too feasible to try to only work with legacy. Sometimes you want to do a bit of both create a new application, work on it, and then also access the, old, the new application in the legacy code. Because there's still some dependencies. There's lots of things that might, that might be happening. Common example, some kind of a GIP lookup that you want to do, you want it to happen in both legacy and your new app. So this is what we could do. We would call our legacy project and it would talk to the symphony and just send a response. Obviously, some of the routes might point to symphony already. Depends on which phase of the project you are. And it's very easy to bootstrap um, such a project. So in your legacy app, first of all, you would need to create a request. And this, this is actually quite a useful object to have. Your old legacy app probably uses global variables directly. This cleans things up a bit and also has some nice behaviors. Uh, you can get client IPs uh, filtered by proxies and stuff like that. Very useful thing to have. Um, in this example, I also said, is legacy true so that I know that request was created in legacy? That might be useful if you call something from your uh, new application. It might be useful to know that that was initialized from uh, legacy. And that script file name needs to be fixed because it was a different file name that uh, Symfony knows. So for Symfony to generate proper routes, it needs to have a proper uh, controller here, front controller. And you create the kernel in some environment and whether it's a bug or not, boot it. This is what Symfony does when you call uh, kernel handle. It first boots the, uh, the, the, the kernel, which instantiates container, does all the caching and um, all the processing there, and you have um, ready kernel ready to go, but you just don't call it, okay? What you can do is access the same container as is available in your Symfony project. So you can start using services from your Symfony project. So examples I've shown before with Tweak, 
the container itself, or the event dispatcher, or any other service that's registered on your Symfony project can be now accessed in the legacy. So I can start calling events. And I can start sharing those events. I can start calling the same events in both applications and have logic migrated over to the new app already. Or access the tweak. It's worth to know how Symfony works internally, so you could perhaps call the same events or similar events. So when the request comes in, Symfony will not call your controller yet, just yet. It will fire a new event, kernel.request. Okay, I know I have a request. Maybe someone is interested in it. And there's some built-in listeners that, that, that handle that. And Mo covers the router listener that does the root matching, but only sets the attributes on the request, of the, sets the attributes of the match root on the request. Um, and you can add your own listeners in here, so that the GOIP look, uh, lookup could happen in here. And you could update the request with your results of your matching. Then, based on the matched root, it resolves the controller, and uh, so it doesn't call it yet. It fires another event. I've got a controller, maybe someone wants to do something about it. And at this point, your listener might change the controller, might uh, enrich the controller. That's when the uh, container is injected into controllers if you implement the container wire interface. It might also param converter listener. You know, in the uh, Symfony controllers, you can inject parameters into your controller uh, method directly. Param converter listener takes care of that. So it looks into the uh, controller's arguments and tries to resolve them. Uh, controller is called, it hopefully returns the response. This is like a happy path. There's more events in Symfony, but this is happy path. Uh, controller returns the response, but it's not returned yet. We call, can, hey, I've got a response. Maybe someone wants to do something about it. That's when, for example, web debug toolbar is injected into the response. If there's a body, if that's an HTML response, HTML uh, web debug toolbar is injected into it. We also have a finish request, uh, object, uh, sorry, event, and then we might, might happen if that, the thing that we uh, returned is not a request, uh, sorry, a response, we'll call um, something that uh, might still recover that situation. So, okay, the thing I got is not a response, but maybe someone knows what to do about it. So you can have listeners that's gonna serialize that object or render a template as the template listener does if there's a template annotation, things like that. Then the response is sent back to the user and we send the, after the response is sent, we fire the kernel terminate event that happens when the user already has the uh, page rendered, but the connection is still persistent. Um, that's where the, all the mails are sent from the spool queue, um, and you can add your own stuff in there. It's used for long-running jobs that shouldn't bother the user, but uh, I wouldn't recommend uh, to use it heavily. It's better to offload that to the message queue rather than doing it in the, in the same request that the user called it. So, and there's more, more events like kernel exception, which is uh, called when the exception is fired, so you can still recover from it. All of those events you can potentially use in your legacy app if you have access to the uh, service container that's also available in your new app. That might be a very powerful um, way to start migrating your old stuff to the new one. Mostly for uh, logic, global logic that happens on all requests. I use it to migrate that logic over. In your legacy code, you see, you'd simply, sorry, you'd simply fire an event. In this case, this is what Symfony kernel does, but we didn't call kernel handle, 
So we need to do it in the legacy app ourselves, if you want to, if you need to. Um, so we would call it in the beginning of request to listen to the same events that our new app listens. We simply dispatch kernel events request. And the final thing, you might also embed your new controllers in your old app, either with uh, ESIs. If you don't know what an ESI is, uh, ESI is it's an um, edge side include. Um, that's a standard developed by Akamai, uh, but also supported by uh, Varnish. And um, what you could do is basically embed a tag like this, ESI include, and the path to another URL. And um, if you have a reverse proxy in front of it, like Varnish, it will call that URL before returning it to the client, assembly the page, and um, return it to the client. Nice thing about it is that each such a block can be cached with a separate lifetime. Um, so you can, um, well, you could simply generate such a tag but if you use the Symfony, uh, one of the fragment renderers, there's few to support. There's an ESI, there's an SSI, um, inline renderer, uh, H include. So you could do the same with Ajax requests and the H include library. Um, you can access the service and render it. Why doing it this way? Well, because if Symfony, if that service recognizes that there's a reverse proxy in front of it, basically it looks for a header, uh, if it has a surrogate capabilities, it will render the SI tag. But if you, on your development environment, don't have that, um, you won't have that header, and Symfony will simply call that controller in line. So it's going to work in both environments. So it's just a nice thing to do. Um, but this way you can start thinking how to migrate pieces of your site, like a navigation, you have a quite complex navigation uh, system that you want to migrate over, redesign completely. You might include it with an ASI, especially that most of the time it's very nicely cached, um, and move it over to the new code base. And um, these are all the ideas I've got today. So thank you very much for listening. And I think I still have some time for questions. Uh, please rate my talk. This is the first time I delivered this talk, so it probably needs some polishing. I am looking forward to your feedback. Um, if there are any questions, this little body looks for a new home, and the best question, according to me, is going to win the elephant. Um, hi. Hi. When you start to work on new legacy code base, how do you choose which approach to use? Well, that depends on the code base. That's a very... <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, but... <laughs> well, I, I would, you, you I would choose the clear separation in the first place uh, as my first choice. But it's not always possible. So sometimes you need to modify the legacy code and then you use those techniques that modify the legacy code. But I would go with clear separation as my first guess. Does it answer your question or not really? <laughs> uh, hi. hi. My question would be, um, you clearly mentioned Symfony 1 and Symfony 2 as a From 2 um, framework that can be used uh, with migration. Do you have any experience with other frameworks and if uh, then maybe there are some better alternatives, so what alternatives? Mm -hmm. I'm talking about Zen 1, Zen 2, and probably many, many more, like even Laravel yeah. and other. Thanks. Um, well, I mentioned Symfony 1 as a legacy project. Um, Symfony 2 or 3, Symfony in general, written with a capital S, so anything above Symfony 2 and Symfony 2. Um, the reason it's nice is because it's uh, component-based. So you can choose and switch uh, components, and eventually you'll probably arrive with a full-stack framework, but because it's component-based, you can easily integrate component by component 
uh, into your old code base, and I've seen people doing that with a great success. Um, I have used Zen Framework 1 and Zen Framework 2, and I don't want to speak publicly about it, so if you ask me later on, I decided not to complain on other frameworks too much publicly. Um, yeah, but it's, and a component-based framework would work, I guess. Um, but I'm a Symfony guy, that's why this talk is mostly based around Symfony. Uh, but any libraries you could incorporate would work as well. I think the key here is a composer. You introduce a composer into your project and you can basically, uh, if you do that, that might be the hardest step to do actually, to integrate a composer auto loading into your legacy. But once you've done that, uh, you, you know, you've got lots of packages to choose from. So uh, where do I put the old uh, code? I don't in, see in you. The, the folder. I'm right there. Ah. <laughs> so I got this old application, mm -hmm. uh, lots of files, and I wonder where in the directory structure do I uh, save all my old files? Do I make a bundle or do I... Do I mm -hmm. have subfolder in the source, or where should I place um, it? Depends how much you want to separate it. In my example, somewhere on the screenshot, there was a legacy folder inside of a project, a Symfony project, for example. But it could be totally separate uh, directory. And most of the time, I would actually do that, because it would encourage people to clearly separate the two and don't mess with legacy too much. Um, so we'd rather try to put them in separate directories. Not always possible, but as much as separation as you can. Does it answer your question? So a legacy folder in the root? Yeah. Uh, so you will have them even in separate repositories, unless you share some bits. But I would try to have them in separate repositories first, and then uh, if that doesn't work, put the, put the legacy into the... Uh, root of the new project. Make sense? <laughs> yeah, hi. Uh, in case if I uh, want to... Light, sir. Oh, okay. Yeah. In case if I want to make kind of inspection of, of my Symfony project, doesn't matter one or two or three, mm -hmm. uh, what the tool you uh, propose to, like, uh, to use? For example, Sensor Insign or something? Uh, you can hire me. <laughs> but apart from yeah, you can, <clears throat> you can uh, yeah, sensor labs inside uh, is one thing. Uh, I would try a few. Uh, I would try a few tools at the same time because they will give you different feedback. Sensor labs inside will give you different feedback than uh, scrutinizer CI, for example. Scrutinizer is an uh, excellent tool that shows you problems with your with design of your code. Um, so I would look into that as one as well. Nothing else comes to mind, mind at this point, but these two. Uh, but I would really uh, also try to get another opinion from outside of your organization. Doesn't have to be me, just any other uh, person who knows Symfony and could assess your, your code. Yeah, because uh, what I've read about the Symfony is uh, independent organizations always check it, so they make uh, audits. Mm -hmm. So probably they use some automation to do it. Uh, not only. Automation is part of it. Automation won't tell you everything, and everything needs to be put in the context. So there's always a guy that also goes through the results and also goes through uh, at least part of the code and try to make his own conclusions. Um, so maybe even within your organization, there's a person who didn't work on that project and he could do like a general code review of, 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 of the project. Or maybe a new person coming in could do that as well. Yeah? How will you migrate something like a, a collection of WordPress sites into that are considered legacy into a Symfony project? Why would you want to migrate a WordPress site? <laughs> Because, <laughs> let's just uh, well, keep in, it that way. <laughs> well, if it's a blog, I guess it could stay WordPress. I don't, 
unless you build some kind of a crazy application based, ah, uh, okay, that's the case. <laughs> <laughs> That's a toughie. <laughs> um, but to be honest, the examples I've shown are based on experience working with code bases worse than WordPress. Um, so you, you, you take the same approach, I guess. With WordPress, I guess you could uh, also use some automated tools for data migration that could help you. You could try them to use, use them and migrate uh, data to some other format and then start from there. And then ap apply the same techniques as i shown here, I guess. Does it help at all? This is, it's, hard, it's hard to have actually a generic talk about legacy, as every legacy is different. <laughs> Hi. <clears throat> so um, you've suggested that uh, we could um, isolate some, uh, and create some smaller applications. Um, so my question is, how do you handle um, data changes uh, in your legacy application across all smaller microservices? Because a general approach for microservices mm -hmm. uh, is that each microservice should have its own database. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yes, but they, they can still talk to each other and not necessarily talk to each other via HTTP as often thought, but via message queues and things like that. So you can notify, I think message queues are a good way of doing that, uh, of passing information between systems. Um, yeah, that's the... Yeah, so now I've got a problem because I don't know which question was the best. <laughs> that was Kiran's idea to do that. <laughs> so she, um, who wants an elephant? <laughs> okay, I'll throw it there. <laughs> Thank you very much.